Dublin's electric tram network was one of the finest in the British Isles and a huge source of pride. William Martin Murphy was in charge of this efficient service. He was a wealthy and powerful businessman with a string of interests across the city. Murphy's tramway company was an obvious target for Jim Larkin. Early in 1913, Larkin began recruiting the relatively well-paid workforce into his expanding union. One of the reasons he was successful was that William Martin Murphy, for the only time in his life, was out sick. But when Murphy came back, in July and found out what was going on, he was horrified. Murphy acted decisively to remove the threat. He began to fire workers who dared to join the union. It was a ploy that forced Larkin's hand and propelled the city into lockout. But the men said, look, you recruited us, this union, you said you'd get us better paying conditions, and now we're losing our jobs. So what are you gonna do about it? The union's response came on the morning of Tuesday, the 26th of August. It was Ladies' Day at the Dublin Horse Show, and Murphy's trams were busy. Larkin picked his moment to strike. At 20 minutes to 10, the network ground to a halt. On cue, drivers and conductors pinned on union badges and abandoned their trams. The plan Larkin had, he looked at the schedules of the tramway company and he worked out that most of his members would be concentrated around Nelson's Pillar at 9.40 a.m. on that morning. So he reckoned if he could stop the trams at that precise moment, he could jam up the whole system. The men left the trams, some of them even took the spare handles with them to ensure they couldn't be readily started again and marched off to Liberty Hall. Tom Stokes' grandfather, John, was among the first tram drivers to walk off the job. For somebody like my grandfather, that decision that each man had to make, will I do it or will I walk away from it, was a huge one. I think that his own rebelliousness would have made him go on with it. Uh, but for all, all of the tram drivers, this was a huge step. <whistles> to take that control lever the key out of, of the tram and to walk away and leave a, a tram load of people behind. That was it. Your, your job was gone. Uh, he certainly didn't do it for an extra bob or two. It was motivated by uh, a belief in what Larkin and Connolly and others were saying about workers' rights and about making progress. Larkin's plan was to gridlock the tram network, but Murphy had other ideas. Next stop in ring one, we the strike looked like a damn squib. The problem was that Murphy had spies and he had replacement crews, went out to all these trams and even took spare handles. So the system was up and running again within an hour. Murphy's shrewd anticipation of the strike delivered round one to the bosses, but events in the city were about to spoil the party. Later that night, Jim Larkin addressed tramway workers at Liberty Hall. If the employers want war, he said, they can have it. Over the next days, workers clashed with police reinforcements sent to keep the trams running. Baton charges left hundreds injured and two dead. On Sunday, Larkin defied a ban and appeared in disguise on the balcony of the Imperial Hotel on O'Connell Street. The hotel was owned by William Martin Murphy. It's almost a piece of theatre. And Larkin, he was quite good at theatrical gestures. So you could blame him for, once again, displaying that egotistical side of his character. Perhaps he would defend himself by simply saying it was important for him to show defiance. In the uproar which followed Larkin's arrest, police attacked the crowd on O'Connell Street battering hundreds to the ground. Later that evening, tenement homes were attacked and ransacked. The employers had the back end of the state, the police as well, and they used those to maximum uh, effect, and that meant, look, let's get this under control once and for all. So the police were determined to take no prisoners. When they got the chance to lay in that to crack a few heads, oh, they didn't hold back. 
Just two days after the Batten charge in O'Connell Street, disaster of a different kind hit the tenements of nearby Church Street. It must have been a noisy evening. There's a lot of kids playing outside in the streets. And there was a play on in the fire match hall across the road here. Uh, the play, by the way, was called the Colleen Bomb. And the people actually inside in the hall thought that the noise of the buildings falling down were sound effects belonging to the, to the play because whoever was running the play was seemingly was famous for these sound effects. It must have been a tremendous crash because there was a policeman on duty on the keys and he actually heard the noise and he ran all the way up Church Street. He gave them a dig out then looking for the people in the rubble. Number 66 Church Street, home to five families, was first to go. The collapse came without warning. Victims were trapped by falling rubble. Of the seven dead, three were children. All we could do was roll them up on a sheet. We couldn't lift them. They were like jelly or pulp, smashed to pieces. The body of one victim, Margaret Rook, was so shockingly mangled that it was impossible to identify her. And Margaret Rook was my great-grandmother. Um, she lived in, a, in number 66 George Street. The legend in my house when we were kids growing up was that she was decapitated and according to the newspaper reports, I'd say it was right. This was a really shocking event that happens right in the middle of the lockout. And this was to have a, a very dramatic effect on what was to happen next. <laughs> 